We've got Mr. David Sarita on the phone with us. How are you today, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm uh, I'm stoked about the interview today. I've listened to you several times. Uh, and and it's my opportunity to throw some questions your way. So yeah. here we are. We're we're in the grand year of 2012. December 21st is a matter of a, it's days away. It's less than 100 days away. It's literally a few uh, what two three three months away. What are we going to see? What is going to happen? The the world is already starting to. Just in the last week, things have been going nuts. Yeah, I mean. Thoughts? My thoughts are that it's <laughs> nothing happens on an exact day, um, although when you look at planetary alignments and, and these type of things, um, even there, you know, lines are, are very vague. I mean, for example, if you take a ruler and you really see how fictitious and you see certain flaws in, in mathematics when you look at a ruler, a ruler because each line has a certain thickness, like you could have 10 centimeters, or 12 inches, and you look at an inch and you have a half and a quarter and eighth, sixteen, mm-hmm. and you bro- blow that ruler up to the size of a solar system, and each one of those lines is bigger than our sun. So <clears throat> when you say something is supposed to happen on a certain day, you know, you go, well, you know, we're already in the day because it's the year, and look what's happened. I mean, in the Middle East, We've had Gaddafi overthrown, you know, Saddam Hussein, the Mubarak, the leader of Egypt. People are suddenly, you know, epically getting empowered to say, we don't want any more of this abuse. We don't want rulers that oppress us to these extreme levels. And we're, we realize we're powerful. We have all the power. We can throw you out on the street. And that, right there on a consciousness level, is is very terrifying to, you know, the the global powers in the, in the industrialized nations like the United States and Europe and even parts of Mexico and South America and and many other mm-hmm. countries in the world because we're highly oppressed. You know, we we you know, I grew up in the 1960s. I I'm, I'm 51 years old and I remember my parents buying a house in Modesto, California for $21,000. And uh, big yard, you know, dogs, four boys, you know, the, it's, it's a huge family living like that. And you go, what happened? Why did we make it so hard just to attain basic human needs? And the idea of basically people being lazy and sitting back and saying, I'm going to make mega millions on real estate transactions and banking transactions and everyone else is going to run around burning fuel like crazy to pay for that mortgage because every time a, a <laughs> price of a mortgage goes up and rent goes up, then you've got to have two incomes to pay for it. So that's two two jobs as opposed to one or one and a quarter, which is what it was when I was a kid. And mm-hmm. so that's more fuel. Like I remember my parents, it would be a miracle after 10 years if you ever, or 20 years, ever hit 100,000 miles on your car. People do that in, in three years now. Yeah, so yeah. The resources we're consuming just to pay for a fictitious number that we invented is what's doing all this and and why we're so addicted to Middle Eastern oil and why we have to be there to control the price of oil and to run it as as a whole technology to extract the oil and get it out of there. And we've gotten ourselves in this mess where where we we actually – give more money in foreign aid to those countries, and they hate us, and they really hate us. And I don't I don't think what just happened recently is really the anger is all related to this film. I think the the Middle Eastern people are, you know, they really don't like the control that we brought with the purchase of all their oil. So with, with yeah. that, you know, why America is keeping UFO UFO technology, zero-point energy, anti-gravity so secret at that cost blows my mind, utterly blows my mind, that we would do that. And, you know, the last thing I'll say on on this question is that um, one thing the global powers don't realize is the more you oppress people, the more they reproduce, their numbers get staggering, 
And in in our country, the oppression seems to have stopped a lot of people from having kids. And therefore, we're pretty weak when it comes to a global scale. We may th- have good weapons, but we don't have a very physically large and capable army and Navy and um, and uh, Air Force. I mean, we may mm-hmm. think we do, but believe me, we, we're not going to compare to China with um, 300 million capable soldiers. So when those, w- the more we oppress our own people through rent and banking and mortgages, then we're actually stopping us from becoming competitive on that level. So we're in trouble. That's what I see. I, absolutely. We're, yeah. But let me let me ask you. I mean, because you you delve into so many realms uh, of exploration of information. Uh, there's a, there's a, we're in a physical world, but uh, I guess a hermetic kind of uh, thought process here. As above, so below. Um, what we're seeing is it being driven by external forces? Um, is it trying to to destroy what 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 the current paradigm is and in an attempt to bring forward a new one? Is it going to hit us like a ton of bricks? What are, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, on a religious level above, you know, our ideas are still pretty primitive, in my opinion, On when you really look at the cosmos and what actually happens to a civilization when they reach interstellar capabilities. I mean, the Mayan calendar predicts, I mean, um, the highest level of the pyramid says we will reach galactic um, consciousness. And before that, we reached global consciousness, which was the Internet, you know, what the, what the Hopi prophecy called the, the web, you know, the spider's web, the World Wide Web, the WWW. Mm-hmm. And we reach this ability now to search information and see what some guy's doing in, in Pakistan or India right from your, your desktop computer in the United States and that's really accelerated consciousness in a certain way. <clears throat> but I'm working on, I've been recently working on for several years now, the based on some good breakthroughs in, in um, consciousness and physics, faster than light signaling of different star systems. And I'm having great success with a technology interface with consciousness that I use to harmonically pulse the all the I calculate all the mathematical harmonic codes of a star system and I started with Pleiades and we did this three years ago <clears throat> on my uh, birthday in August 21st and when I first sent out the the broadcast I actually sent my wife singing um, the Frank Sinatra song Fly Me to the Moon my, my wife is a beautiful <laughs> jazz singer and we thought okay nothing's going to happen I can't I don't know if this is going to work um but we did it, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I heard a clear, audible, very compassionate male voice say, congratulations, we received your message. Now what do you want to ask us? Now, this isn't a mental dialogue. Like You could go into a trance, or a psychic could go in a trance, and they can get mental imagery inside of the mind's eye. This is clearly audible, what is known in spirituality as a locution which is an activation of something in the brain so you actually hear. And I just leaped out of bed and went, oh, my God, you know, my wife was the first one to send an interstellar jazz song through <laughs> through, through the local uh, galaxy. And I was so excited. And the next day I got up and I started asking, you know, rec- what I do is I record in Pro Tools with a really good microphone a series of questions addressing the Palladian um, council, and I then take that file and I, I plug it into a, a player um, and goes into an amplifier into this technology. And the technology involves some living um, biology. And uh, this is an area that's really interesting because a physicist named Fritz Albert Popp from Germany, good physicist, standard physicist, discovered and proved that all living systems are emitting biophotons, you know, which are, you know, rays of light that come off of the everything living, and he proved the origin huh. of those biophotons is DNA. Fascinating. And those biophotons were traveling faster, much much faster than the speed of light. So, 
if we were going to try to talk to the Pleiades, which are 440 light years away, oh my God, that's impossible distance. You know, that would take 440 years sure. to send a signal, and, and that's probably why the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, with its hundreds of millions of dollars in funding, hasn't found a sig- single intelligent signal from anywhere else in the universe. Mm-hmm. Well, this is starting to hit mainstream science, what I'm talking about, because there, there's an article, you know, it's a few years old, uh, April 26, 2011, and the title is um, DNA Could Act as an Antenna in Electromagnetic Communication. And this is, you know, mainstream scientists are proving that DNA, this is a, a, an idea that was first, presented by a French virologist, which is, you know, the study of viruses, by Luc Montagnier, in 2009. And he found that bacteria and the DNA in bacteria responds to to transmissions. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Mm. Because now companies are making transistors. Transistors are the little uh, crystal chips that are in radios. They're making transistors that interface with living um, chlorophyll or bacteria that are living. In fact, now there are scientists that are storing computer programmable data, that means pictures, movies, word files, everything, in bacteria. In fact, a hmm. millionth of a gram of E. coli can store more than a terabyte. And it's right there. They can retrieve the data. So it's te- what it's telling you is that all this work on these, you know, very cutting edge PhD physicists um that I have in my movie Quantum Communication for example, their work is starting to affect mainstream science because mainstream science is interested in faster than light, you know, communication not only not for the ideas as exotic as what I'm talking about probably, but for for communicating with satellites, you know, at the far reaches of the solar system instantly rather than this huge, you know, several uh, minute time delay. I think it takes 8.3 minutes for sunlight to come from the sun to hit Earth. Well, hmm. there's a Russian scientist uh, whose story is in our, our, the film Water, the Great Mystery we distribute, and he, um, Alexander Jajewski, d- notices under the microscope that all these bacteria are going crazy and erratic instantaneously in this moment which he later calculates is the exact moment a coronal mass ejection left the sun. But that actual electromagnetic signal won't hit Earth for 8.3 minutes, but they already received the signal faster than light. Incredible. Is this bordering on on, uh, unlocking uh, telepathy? I mean, that's what it kind of sounds like here. Well, it's really proving how telepathy works. You know, so one of the areas I've I've spent a lot of time in the last several years is studying very old. You know, what is old now is late 1800s, early 1900s solid state physics, which is the study of the properties of materials, and that really gets into the birth of, for example, the crystal oscillator um, transistors, which are all crystal-based technology. Um, to give you an example, like William Shockley, John Bardeen, and Will Bratton invented and won the Nobel Prize for the, for the discovery of the first working transistor. And a transistor is a miniature amplifier. Um, mm-hmm. In the early days when we were broadcasting radio after Tesla invented radio and, and demonstrated it in 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair, um, radio was very limited to broadcast, you know, probably not more than 50 to 100 miles, and you had a lot of static the further away you got. Using using amplifiers that were tube-based amplifiers, tube and you know gas based, and there was a problem. And these physicists, um, John, you know, John Bardeen and Will Bratton and and Will Shockley, it's actually Shockley who started it. They noticed at working at Bell Labs that crystals, quartz crystal, had free electrons floating on the surface. That, and electrons are the the little guys that run down the copper wire that ends up lighting your light bulb and turning on your computer and you know your toaster. Mm-hmm, and everything. Mm-hmm. So they're like drops of water going down a river, hitting a paddle. So electrons carry the electric force, and there's free. Normally they're bound in in shells inside of atoms in materials. 
So in a copper wire, they're all bound. But in crystal, there there's countless uh, great numbers of these free electrons floating on the surface of crystals. And they went, wow, if we could run a wire a hair's breadth above the crystal, those little electrons should jump on like passengers on a train, and we got an amplifier. <laughs> it took... It took them a long time because all their math ended up being wrong, and math is usually, you know, wrong until later. But mm -hmm. um, they eventually figured out if you put the whole thing in water, it worked, and they had an amplifier. And so they had this solid state and liquid state crystal amplifier, and they said, well, we can't use these because, you know, the water's going to dry out. And they they eventually figured out that the wire had to make contact with the crystal, and voila, there you go, it worked, they had an amplifier. And in fact, when the first computers came out, there was like a couple of thousand microtransistors um, in the first Intel computer chips. Now there's 2.7 billion on the mm. nanoscale, which is a billionth of a meter scale, crystal um, transistors in your Intel chip in your computer. And from there, the whole world changed because of crystals. So what I did is I want I wanted to know how crystals could really affect telepathy and consciousness. And so we did um, long studies on getting the body, measuring the body electricity. We are electrical beings. We have positive and negative ions running through our nervous system. And ions are bigger than electrons because they're basically atoms or protons with a negative or positive charge on them, as opposed to atoms that are balanced out by negative and positive and have no charge. Mm -hmm. So electrons can, if they jump onto our our atoms in our nervous system, then you get a lot of energy flowing in the nervous system. So I thought we could, measuring the millivolts, you take a voltmeter and put it in the 200 m section, and you can see, you know, the body. Most people might have, on the surface of their skin, 10 millivolts, um, some a lot less than that, and a few people I've seen have uh, 30. <clears throat> so hmm. what I did, there's scientists who invented, one of the first inventors of the hard drive, Marcel Vogel, they were already using crystal at Stanford University in the 90s to store hard computer information in crystal, which was, would be another huge revolution. Mm -hmm. and I, I thought, read about that you know, recently. Yeah, I thought I can store harmonic information because I know how to electronically program crystal with harmonic information. And let's see if I put the NASA sound of the sun, for example, which in the Hindu ancient Vedic system is where the sound mantra Om comes from when you chant the mantra Om in meditation. It, that's where huh. they get it from is from hearing the sun in deep meditation. So I put that in crystals. And I didn't do it with sound waves. I did it in a very proprietary way. And when people touch it and then let go when I measure their millivolts, they're way higher. And we did this over and over and over, and we, we sell these things, and we, we started doing beautiful silver windings around them because the first transistors, where all the amplification was, is where the wire, silver or gold, was touching the crystal was all the, was all the power was. And I may start making those pendants, and my God, they were getting huge amplification. On, in fact, the huh. very remember when transistor radios came out? Yep. And they had those little cool little radios, and you could listen to uh, anything you wanted. You know, the horse races was what I used to listen to in the '60s <laughs> in Berkeley, and it was so exciting. Well, that's because this company Fairchild was making these tiny little crystal transistors and, and putting them in radios, and suddenly you could have a miniature radio instead of this huge tube amp radio that your grandparents probably had sitting in the house, and you could go anywhere and listen to you know music and everything you wanted to. Well, think of the body the same way. The body, the, our bones are calcium, phosphorus, and uh, you know a few other trace silica, which is quartz crystal, um, in the bone. So our bones are like solid state crystals and they're surrounded by a blood, you know, network that delivers a lot of trace minerals for conductivity. The first transistors were uh, crystal, germanium and quartz and they put thin layers of phosphorus on top of it just like our bones have. And 
our bodies basically deliver all of these um, you know, crystal and, and mineral content and store them in, in the different gland centers in the body, from the base of the spine to the adrenals to the thymus, which you know governs the heart and the pineal gland, and then you have the pituitary and pineal and the brain thyroid mm-hmm. gland. So all these glands are corresponding to our chakras, which are like circuits. But measuring people's millivolts, I found, because I've tested personally over a 1,000 people, most people were so weak, they they couldn't really effectively be very good transmitter receivers, meaning telepathy. And, in fact, with these crystal pendants uh, that, that we have at lightstreamtechnologies.com, for anybody who's interested, the, the body's millivolts would go so high, we thought... Like, you know, from from 10 to 150 millivolts on the surface mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is huge. And even, I've been to 300 um, on a Brazilian blue quartz, um, you know, technology that we have. And then we decided, mm-hmm. let's do some aura camera photography to really make sure this is affecting the whole nervous system, not just the local nerve um, where the voltmeter is. And... People were buying pendants and going to the aura camera booth and getting their pictures before and after, and it was mind-blowing to see the difference. I mean, way brighter, more color, more intense color, better balance in the left and right hemisphere. So then we decided to use a really advanced aura camera, the GDV, designed by Konstantin Korotkov in, in Moscow. And, mm-hmm. my God, the difference was so unbelievable, this woman's aura before and after. There's so much more light, and all of her chakras were balanced, and they were talking to each other better. We said, that's, that's, no one's going to believe this. This is impossible. But you go back to the radio and you say, well, how much electricity were these transistors amplifying a radio signal by compared to the human body? And the first transistors were amplifying the microwatt, which means millions of a watt scale, just a few microwatts. Our pendants were amplifying the nervous system from... 5 millivolts to 150 to 2 and 300 millivolts, so way more, way more amplification mm. than even that. So the people who were using them and people who, who buy them were, were reporting uh, amazing telepathy, better dreams, better coherency, higher levels of energy in the body, all just from having contact with the body with these harmonically treated crystals. So we then started getting more advanced and putting different harmonic codes inside of them. The the, the uh, frequencies of flowers, subatomic particles, uh, religious mantras. Uh, we can take any audio file. And even now, star systems, I can program Sirius, Alpha Centauri, or Sirius A and B because I, I have all the, the harmonic codes for those star systems. And what is... Yeah, that that's where this is all going. And so when you when you understand the DNA is a transmitter receiver, scientists are acknowledging this, and that bio DNA transmits signals faster than light speed. That if your your bio photons in your body were told the right harmonics of a target destination, you know, I'll be that I'll be at a a star system or a particular religious deity. You would you would be a better radio transmitter receiver to set up that communication. That's inc- let me ask you because I mean you, you're opening a, a doorway here uh, with the time frame. I, I, I'll share my own experiences. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Overall, you know, I, I try and keep an open mind, but I kid you not, I, I feel. Uh, I, I, I can tell you that my physical energy is, is going up. I, I, I measure it, I, I, I work out regularly, but it's going up. I also feel that uh, my intuitive abilities uh, in many ways are going up. And mm-hmm. that brings up the question with our, the, the time frame that we're in. Um, you know, it, you're, you're talking about receiving signals and, and this and that. Are we entering, uh, with this technology, are we also entering just a, a state of being in the universe where things are going to start kicking on, I don't know, the junk DNA or, or uh, junk brain matter we don't use, but, uh, what, 10% of our brain? Yeah, well, there's, you know, NASA has determined that there is a galactic superwave that is coming and is incredibly close to the solar system right now. And there are 
a number of people like Sheldon Neidl, who many years ago in the 90s was told by ETs about the galactic superwave. My friend Peter Sterling had an experience with ETs, and they told him it was coming. And I'm looking at NASA's ability to detect this superwave and how far away it is from us right now. They're saying it's about 100 years away, but NASA's never seen a galactic superwave enter the solar system. So they act like they know, but they really don't know because they're wrong on even the velocity of coronal mass ejections from the sun coming to Earth, and they can be as much as two days off or mm-hmm. even three days off on those. And that's a very short distance compared to where this wave Absolutely. is. And if you look at the, the bow of a boat moving through water, the longer the boat goes, let's say a perfectly calm lake, and you start moving the boat, and you say, I can photograph the bow shock wave at the front of the bow that's rippling off the bow of the boat, and say, well, it's only I can only see that it's a foot away from the bow. And NASA has taken photographs with certain cameras that can see the bow of this wave. But the longer a, a wave is traveling, the bow gets larger and larger and larger, and the, the front of it is more and more subtle and hard harder and harder to detect. This wave has been traveling for, according to NASA, for, um, I believe, over a million years, and millions of years. And they they saw it on the, there's two cameras. You can actually Google this, um, Galactic Superwave, Paul LaViolette, and um, you'll see amazing pictures and articles from NASA's IBEX camera. And then there's another camera that, that actually was able to see the huge explosion in the center of our galaxy. But I'm, I've got all these meters in my house, and I saw, starting August 15th, a huge increase in background magnetic field. No, nothing increased in the microwaves where we transmit cellular data, so there's, no, I, there's nothing going on there. And I'm also seeing an increase in the electric field, and it's been consistent, and with, with that, Suddenly, there was a large increase in high five, six, and seven point earthquakes continuously going on and still going on now since that, since the middle of August. Um, scientists at Purdue University, you know, years ago were seeing a sudden change in the decay rates of nuclear particles on the sun. And those mm-hmm. decay rates don't change, they are fixed. And the only thing that could be changing the decay rates of these particles is an incoming wave of energy that's transferring energy to speed up the decay rate, which means it's already here. And therefore, our DNA is receiving it. Um, about a month ago, actually the middle of August, which is you know roughly a month ago, my wife and I in the same night dreamt of this super wave of light coming in and in her dream, she was in a movie theater and with all these people, and the wave just blasted through the walls. And in her dream, certain people who were ready got powers. It was like X-Men. And the people who got the powers, the military was afraid of them, so they were trying to you know, chase them down. And in my dream, the galactic superwave talked to me, and it said that if you recognize that I am intelligent, if this isn't just you know, cosmic energy like a nuclear blast, this is an intelligent light wave, I I will activate you and give you abilities, super abilities. And we both had the dream the same night, and I posted it on Facebook, and tons of people were reporting similar phenomena in their their consciousness. And so that's that's pretty exciting, what that could mean, you know, for for us getting a DNA activation and upgrade. and inc- improving our psychic and, and spiritual abilities, and our and our ability to communicate with um, other dimensional beings. Why? I mean, I, I, I'm I'm curious on that. I've got two questions. I'm, I'm going to throw them out there because I want you to do the speaking. This is so interesting. One uh, first question is: Are you seeing a change? This is you're saying most of these changes have started since August. So. One, are you seeing a change in the crystal technology you're working with? And then two, why only certain people? Well, you know, I've been meditating every day for 30, 32, 33 years now. I started when I was 18, and I, I never stopped. So every single day I've been meditating. 
and doing different techniques, breathing techniques, insight meditation. You know, I've I've practiced different world uh, religious practices very thoroughly, and Mm -hmm. I've done retreats. So I'm very sensitive, and so I, you know, when you're doing control scientifically and you're saying, you know, is this technology only going to affect someone who's super sensitive? And um, I have these transmitting devices that we built into flashlight tubing, and we put, you know, very high-end rubies and Term, a tourmaline crystal oscillator electromagnet inside, and I'm pulsing out through this device, which we sell at the LightStreamTechnologies.com, and I can pulse now. I mathematically decoded the Great Pyramid with the theory that it is an actual crystal electro, um, oscillator, what's known as a... Before transistors, you had crystal oscillators, and they're generally used in am, amplification and timing and keeping accurate timing. Because uh, mm-hmm. when you when you ionize or charge electrically a crystal, um, it will cause the electrons in it to oscillate within the geometry, the perimeter of the geometry. So, you know, that's a huge story in itself because that's the real secret to my theory that the pyramids are faster than light crystal oscillators. And um, this gets really, really amazing. It's going to answer your question. When I did it, the first one I built, the first oscillator I built, I didn't do the pyramid yet. I only had the NASA sound of the sun and a few other harmonic codes like Fibonacci's um, codes, 23 Fibonacci golden numbers. And I had a woman whose daughter, a three-year-old, had broke her shoulder, and um, the doctors couldn't get the nerves to grow back in her arm, and her fingers didn't move. Her arm was dead, and they tried nerve grafting, everything. So she bought one of my devices and used it on her and reported in three months her daughter could mo- um, had one-third of all of the movement back in her arm and, and fingers. And, hmm. and, and the way it does that is it's pulsing uh, a, a magnetic wave carrying harmonic information rather than just you know a single frequency of pulse all the way through the body into the nerves and it's activating them to grow back and to harmonize them. I was so excited about it that I started making more of them, and people people were using them for pain loss, but I was more interested um, in them for cosmic reasons. You know, and I that's when I started doing the math on um, Sirius A and B, because Sirius A and B is a legendary Egyptian star system where the goddess Isis and Osiris are said to reside, um, and many other ancient Egyptian um goddesses and gods, and I thought Robert Temple, who wrote the book The Serious Mystery, really a, a very, very prestigious British astronomer, risked his whole career to write that book, he believed that mermaids and mermen came from there to Earth uh, many, many thousands of years ago. And I thought, wow, they're only 8.3 uh, or 7 light years away. I can do the, the math and figure out the frequency of those two stars very easily, because NASA knows the radius, and once you know the radius of a star, you can figure out the frequency, just the same way you can figure out <laughs> mathematically the Tesla-Schumann frequency of Earth. So, and you have to understand that the beauty of, like, you know when you look up at the stars at night, and they're all in different arrangements. They're all in different, you know, like you look at the, um, uh, you look at the Pleiades, they're rising right now in the east, you know, just after, uh-huh, just, uh-huh. Um, Midnight, very beautiful. I looked at them last night, and they're a legend, legendary star system. And you say, okay, 440 light years away, um, but Sirius is only 8.3 light years away. But the beauty of the stars are is the ratios and the angles and the separation from each other is proprietary. There's no, there's no other star system that has that same exact arrangement. And if, and in addition to that, there's no two stars together. You need two or more to get a harmonic code that have the same diameter, which means the frequencies of those two stars together, one small one, one big one, and the distance they are from each other is very unlikely anywhere else in the whole galaxy, believe it or not. Every single star system has a very unique <coughs> signature. So my theory was that if you could vibrate your DNA with that exact signature, it would send the biophotons faster than light coming out of your DNA to that system, 
And inversely, the system, if there's any intelligent beings in there who are very good meditators or very advanced beings, they would pick up the signal. And I developed my first system. We used chlorophyll, plant chlorophyll interface with, with handmade big transistors. And I did all the codes on Pleiades, and I sent it, and we had that experience. So I decided mm. to do it with, with um, firstly, the pyramids, you know, the pyramid frequencies, and then on to Sirius and then Alpha Centauri. So this is going to answer the question, do you have to be super sensitive? Well, I had a customer buy one, and she ran the great pyramid frequencies, and the first night she was half asleep, and boom, there were three Egyptian priests in her room and all these hieroglyphs, and bang, they were gone. She wrote me the next day, <laughs> and I said, wow, wow, that is incredible how I have another person who tried this who doesn't meditate every single day. I mean, she's an artist. She's very. She's probably what you would consider a sensitive for sure. But then I started getting more stories. And so I don't know how sensitive you, necess- you really have to be to, to receive um, a transmission, you know, in your body. I, I'm not 100% certain. I mean, the way a television screen works and a computer screen works is the the radio photons or the microwave photons, or, which are television photons, are carrying the colors and the picture arrangements that you see on your screen. And because the screen is a liquid crystal display, you know, and all, or or even a a solid state crystal display, as they're getting into now, the biophotons just show the pictures that are being carried in the transmission. And now we know scientists are saying your DNA is like an antenna; it's a transmitter receiver. You receive a message faster than light, it's going to display the images in your consciousness. And because your body is a is a liquid solid state crystal just like all these computers are, but it's actually more sophisticated. So it, it all explains how telepathy works on both an audible telepathy and a pictorial telepathy experience, how it displays in the dream. I mean, the reason the dream state is interesting, you know, we have a, a partner... Who, who sells our pendants in Canada, Dami Egbiani, and he's a professional brainwave mapper. And he had a $60,000 brainwave machine, came to our house, and, and you know, he, he he sells our wands in Canada. And he measured my brainwaves and my, my wife's brainwaves um, when we went into meditation. And my brainwaves um, were quite shocking in the sense that they were producing deep, deep theta, which is deep meditation, but the meter was going to the end of the limit of the ability of the the brainwave reader to read how powerful that wave was. And then I went into deltas, which are super, super deep brainwaves, normally only seen in infants. And and infants and, and young children, when they're relaxed, they go into ultra deep, Samad, what are known in India as samadhi states or, or very high consciousness states where the subconscious is wide, wide open. And those states, um, a lot of us reach theta in our sleep, you know, upper theta, mm-hmm. where visions are very, very likely to occur. And some of the visions can cause higher frequency functions of the brain to start spiking and produce what are known as gammas in the brainwave spectrum. And I had a bunch of those, and I also had um, my deltas and thetas were off the chart. Well, the, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is the reason most of us get our psychic visions of future earthquakes, tsunamis, and things that are uh, spiritual in nature, visitations um, of angels and spirits behind sleep is, is we don't, train to go into theta and delta in the waking state. So it's not unusual for humans to reach theta and delta, but it's unusual in the waking state, the brainwave mapper told me. So I can do that because I've been doing this for 30 years. So that means someone like me can have full 3D in the body, eyes open, you know, visitations, which I've had hundreds of. And mm. and that explains why that's possible. But why, for example, this woman using the wand, she was in the half-in, half-out sleep state, she saw the Egyptian priest, is because the wand was transmitting the 
frequencies of the Great Pyramid, and, and they are so evolved, they picked up the signal, and they said, wow, let's go, let's go check out who's, who's transmitting the, our signal. And they go and do it, and they, they visit that person. And that's where we're headed. We're, we're headed with an interface of tra- crystal transistor technology interface with consciousness, and that is probably the only place we're going to see faster than light communication happening. That's, where, that's what we think so far, because they, there's only a few indications that you can do it with solid state by itself with no consciousness involved. There's only, there was an experiment done in Cambridge in England that you can Google this. It's very subtle. Sci- qu- scientists quantum entangled two diamonds, and uh, diamonds are carbon, and carbon is amazing electrical properties. Un- mm-hmm. Untapped and uncharted electrical properties of carbon um, in the solid state world. And carbon may supersede and overtake and usurp uh, silicon in telecommunication chips in the future. That's what I'm seeing in, from the news I'm reading. And they quantum entangled them and separated them at a distance, and they were communicating not through the electromagnetic spectrum, but through Einstein's action at a distance. And that's what the article states. But I, action at a distance means faster than light. If you Google, if you understand action at a distance, it's a different quantum function. It is not a radio wave. So they didn't want to say it's faster than white diamonds, but it is because it's action at a distance. And w- when you go to look at what the pyramids are and how they're made in multiple layers of material from granite cores to two different types of limestone outer casing you go well that's how transistors are made you have to you have to use multi-layer solid state materials you can't use a single material you have to multi-layer it because you you've got to create what's known as difference between materials to cause electrons the carriage of the electrical force to flow from one place to another. Voltage means difference, setting up difference, which causes amps or current to flow. Mm-hmm. So I took a um, an old Fairchild solid state transistor from a radio, old radio. I bought some and I put them on my fingertips and measured my baseline millivolts and I plugged myself into one of those little guys and I had a significant increase in my energy. Now, knowing that, Imagine the size of the Great Pyramid. Three pyramids in the Giza Plateau, all in the ratio, ratio is key, of Orion's belt. Three stars that are about 1,000 to 1,100 plus light years away, even further than Pleiades. Why would they do this? Why would the Egyptians build giant solid-state crystal oscillators and possibly as transistors on that size scale, would it actually be able to physically move a person from here to there faster than white? Not just telepathy. Wow. I'm already getting telepathy on a small scale version of that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot more to it than just doing crystal oscillators in the ratio of a star system. You, you, there's a core unit that goes on the inside. And that is very key. Otherwise, it will not work. And this is this gets mind blowing. Patrick Flanagan, who lives in Sedona, also, um, if you haven't interviewed him, he's an amazing interview. Genius uh, electrical engineer when he was young, and and recently on Coast to Coast AM is the the uh, reincarnation of Tesla is, is what is being said about huh. him. And I know him. He wrote the book Pyramid Power, and brilliant book, unbelievable what's in that book. And he had these little photos of little pyramids that they electrified, and it caused these cones of electricity to go jetting out of the apex, out of the top of the pyramid. And there's a guy in the Yucatan who takes a picture of Chichen Itza. I saw that. With the with the with the light going right out of the cone, and you can see the lightning strike hitting the ground in the background. I got a copy of the original photo directly from from Mexico, and because I'm doing a movie on on the Great Pyramids, my theory of them as interstellar um, stargates. And um, anyway, see the electricity from the lightning strike goes into the ground, and what it does inside of a pyramid is it oscillates around the square wave base of the pyramid all the way to the apex, where the waves compress 
so intensely, you get this cone of light shooting out so fast that that you can't see it with the naked eye, but the guy's camera saw it. People were saying, oh, that's a, that's a vertical or horizontal line from your camera, your digital camera. Mm-hmm. And, and vertical lines do occur on a video camera, video mode only on these cameras that I have. I have the best cameras you can buy, you know, um, and they, they do not cross the whole frame of his photo. They only start at the apex of the pyramid and go up. So that is not a vertical, horizontal, mm-hmm. digital mm-hmm. artifact. That is an artifact of the wave compression in the, in the pyramid. Now, this is utterly mind-blowing, what I'm going to tell you now, because in my presentation I gave at the UFO Congress last February, I showed you know pictures of this. You can actually see this you know uh, presentation in my new film coming up. But in, at Berkeley, a physicist named Raymond Chow, University of California, Berkeley, in the 1980s and 90s, was getting light to go faster than light by sending a crystal light source beam, he would send one through or, uh, reflected off of a mirror and one of its counter photons, particles of light, goes through a very, very thin slice of silica, which is quartz. And it goes faster than light. It goes 1.7 times the speed of light through quartz. So it has a barrier, but it goes faster than light. Mm. And I talked to Raymond Chow on the phone and he didn't even know why it was happening. He only knew that it was, it seemed to be compressing the wave to go from a, sh- a longer wavelength to a shorter wavelength, just what uh, what the structure of a pyramid would do as a crystal oscillator. So if you Google silica, what is known as the crystal lattice geometry, which is the way molecules bond in quartz, it's a three-sided pyramid. And because it's a three-sided pyramid, when waves hit the base of it, they're going to compress at the apex, and that explains how it went faster than white, the same way the big pyramids are doing it. And then, this is even more mind-blowing, and this was on NBC News uh, some years ago, a physicist at Princeton University, Li Zhen Wang is his name, Li Zhen Wang, gets light to go 300 times light speed by sending a crystal light source, interesting, always crystal light source, through cesium. So I googled what is the cesium Mm. chloride gas, what is the, what is the, um, what is the lattice structure, the geometry, of cesium, and it turns out it's it's six in invert six um, cubic four-sided pyramids. So you have four-sided pyramids that are all facing each other in a cube, not a regular cube, a six pyramids inside of a cube. So we're four-sided pyramids, which is what the pyramids at Giza were. So four-sided pyramids caused a wave to compress so highly it went 300 times the speed of light. That's enough to get you to the Pleiades and and like zip like that. Wow. And they did this, and, and there's no more word of it. It's all, you can't find anything else on the Internet about Legion Wang, where his experiments have gone. And I guarantee you, our military knows how to do this. They know how to send signals now to star systems faster than light. And, and I'm doing it, but on a very small scale. I can, I can do it and have them communicate back to me. But just if the military were to try to send them a signal and they said, you know, I don't want to talk to you, well, they don't, they don't send a message back, right, because they don't want to talk mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. These beings, if they're spiritually evolved, they're going to feel your integrity, they're going to feel who you are, and you're not necessarily going to get an answer back um, on that level. So that, that proves two experiments at two major universities, Princeton and Berkeley, that on, on, a, on a molecular scale, molecules are just atoms, and bonded together in geometries. Um, We have two faster-than-light experiments that both use pyramidal geometries. So when you go back to the big pyramids, and you say, and this is all, and I did all the math in the Great Pyramid to determine its its crystal oscillation frequencies, and the numbers are utterly mind-blowing. And I have these at at the lightstreamtechnologies.com on CDs that people can, can buy if, if they can't afford the, the $1,800 WAN transmitters, and they can just play the audio CD and listen to the sounds, <laughs> which are really beautiful. And I so I transmitted the pyramid frequencies, and you can see it. Go to Spaceman99, my YouTube channel, Spaceman99, and look at pyramid frequencies video, and you'll see my flashlight tubing, which is powered, um, and the 
frequencies are going through it, and I place ball magnets on four dishes. If you transmit the any single frequency through that transmitter, the balls don't move. They vibrate. If you put the NASA sound of the sun through it, um, it, the balls vibrate vigorously, but they don't move. With the pyramid frequencies and the 23 Fibonacci frequencies, they move in big circles, which is, uh, I believe, the pyramid has the secret to how planets are being are moving around a central star in a, in a magnetic gravitational uh, relationship. So I think that's what's going on there, and there's 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 amazing things that happen when you pulse your DNA with these harmonic codes. There are specific numbers in the in the Great Pyramid's math that are so mind blowing, so utterly mind blowing that I when this film comes out, it's going to turn the table on what, and prove what the pyramids were for, who they were in communication with, and I've mathematically tied the Ark of the Covenant to the to the pyramids. Your new film when when is it coming out and what is it called? It's called the Quantum Pyramid, and it's it's going to come out this winter. Okay, let me ask you. Uh, we, we've got about ten minutes left, and I want to throw out a curveball question here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, as I said, I've, I've listened to a lot of uh, your interviews, and I've actually read quite a bit of your uh, work. Uh, there are people on this earth right now that don't want this change. They don't want it. They're fighting against it. Uh, your wife's dream, talking about, uh, she mentioned the military was after people that had abilities. Uh, I, I, I do find that a, almost a prophetic uh, account. Uh, you, you know, one, who are and, and what feeds the, the, I don't know, the negativity? And two, what do people as a whole, what can we each individually do to try and uh, foster a change for the better? Well, those, those are great questions. I mean, what feeds negativity is scarcity and fear of losing control of a situation or a people. And there's whole economic structures in place, like, you know, the church, and especially the Catholic church, was an economic superpower and still is an economic superpower mm-hmm. because they convinced us that if you, when you die, donate your entire will to the church, you're going to go to heaven. That's a belief structure. And and people are so afraid of hell because we the church is taught the fear of hell was so great that people are willing to not even take care of their own family and children and just give away the entire estate to the church. And they became an enormous power. When you think of even today, you know, what mortgages and, and rent has done to, and how much it's oppressed especially Western civilization and European civilization. It's oppressed us so much that many of us don't, many of my friends don't have kids, and they didn't have children at all. I just, 51, I have a two-year-old daughter. It took me a long time. We, and, you know, the IRS is so oppressive and so terrifying and so Absolutely. awful. What they've done to us is they basically said, you know, you can't have children because you're going to, you're going to owe us so much money, and the cost to own a house is almost unattainable now, and that's why everybody lost their homes. Mm-hmm. You're, you're basically killing your own people and inviting another com- country to come and take you over. It's basically what you're doing. That's where we're headed. We're headed to the point that we'll, someone will take us over. Somebody like China will probably conquer us uh, militarily. And it's very, very sad because the, the people who control all the wealth and all the power here don't realize they made it impossible for us to raise children here um, because of these enormous um, financial burdens that other countries don't impose on their people, and that's why they have billions of people. I mean, look at the land mass of America. It should be a billion people. But nevertheless, Mm -hmm. and if it was a billion people and we didn't have to drive our cars so much and burn all this fuel, it would be sustainable because we can use electric cars now and solar energy and and move on to zero-point energy. But we seem to want to lose this this situation and we are we're probably going to lose i want us to win but i do believe me i i'm not i just see us doing everything wrong to to make this not work yeah. and being a father i can i can tell you that it is excruciatingly difficult financially just i mean i don't own a home or anything like that i we own our car 
It cost us ten thousand dollars cash to have our baby. <laughs> I mean, unbelievable. Wow. Half the price that a house was in the in the seventies. But um, this is where we're going, you know, and we're we also have some of the greatest breakthroughs and inventions in this country, and the the abilities, the super abilities of people threaten the military and threaten the powers because their fear is that if we don't control the people that we'll lose. But actually, if you let us go and you let us start literally opening stargates to other star systems, we'll learn so much we'll actually win. And you, our oppressor, will probably benefit greatly from opening up that relationship. And if you allow us to have a lot of children then we can start sending children to different planets and different star systems through gates. And there's, there's, only, there's only shared presence and knowledge to gain. There's nothing to lose. But they think, oh, we've got to control them, because if we don't control them and oppress them, then they're going to get away on us, and they're going to have new ideas, and they're not going to give us the entire estate to the Catholic Church when they die. And when different star beings start to appear with amazing abilities, abilities to uh, give us immortality and raise the dead, you know, Osiris was raised from the dead by his sister and wife, uh, Isis. Um, they were they were married, but very distant, distant, uh, related to each other. So they were technically, you know, in a large royal family, and they were considered uh, relatives. Um, but the the idea of resurrection is not new, and it happened before Christ. And Christ was raised and brought up in Egypt in the Middle East. He probably learned how that was actually done. And so if there are when more and more people reach true luminosity, true enlightenment, the ability to go interstellar, um, it's all going to change eventually no matter what. But the oppressive type personalities that are so greedy, like Mubarak, $47 billion. I mean, who mm-hmm. needs $47 billion? Now he's dead. He's in a coma or he's dead. I can't remember. His people have overthrown him. Why? Because you're so greedy. Like this consciousness of I have to have so much money so I can sit in a in hundred different mansions all over the world is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And the idea Absolutely. that there's no money is, is the biggest lie of all. <laughs> it's the biggest joke. It's all around it's, us. It, the, it's the abundance all around is us. all around us. Yeah. See, the, the bank gets money from the Federal Reserve who creates it out of thin air, and they loan it to you. You build a house, and because you built the house, there's now an asset that the money is worth. But before the house was built, there's no asset. It took three guys six months to make the house, but you owe 40 years of your life on it. We don't do that anymore. We can have houses for everybody. We can have sustainable you know, solar and, and eventually move on to zero-point energy everywhere. There's lots of food. We know how to grow food. There's many plants that, um, like comfrey that, that uh, I grow here and, and live on. It has 18 amino acids in it. It has the ability to speed up cell regeneration, B6 mm. and B12. It grows like crazy. These leaves are the size of tobacco leaves, and they taste fantastic. I put them in my t- t- potato pancakes this morning. Complete protein, <laughs> grows like crazy. We can feed the world. There's, It's a big lie. What they're doing is a big lie. And keeping they, us in these mortgages is, is criminal, criminal. David, we're, we're, we're down to about three minutes. I wish I, I, I had thought this was going to be just an hour interview. Um, I wish now I would have just made it an hour and a half and just forced you to stay on the line. Uh, uh, one, I want to ask you uh, in the future if you have time to come back on the program because you cover it. Well, absolutely. You know, you're local to me, um, so just contact me in, in the coming months and we can continue where we left off, you know. Do you, do you actually have a store in uh, Sedona? Is there a storefront, or, or is there something? No, we you... we we're all online. Our our pendants and the wands are at LightStreamTechnologies.com. We have all the power. We can throw you out on the street, and that right there on a consciousness level is is very terrifying to you know the the global powers in the, in the industrialized nations like the United States and Europe and even parts of Mexico and South America and, and many other mm-hmm. countries in the world because we're highly oppressed. You know, we, we you know, I grew up in the 1960s. I'm, I'm 51 years old, and I remember 
my parents buying a house in Modesto, California for $21,000. And uh, big yard, you know, dogs, four boys, you know, the, it's, it's a huge family living like that. And you go, what happened? Why did we make it so hard just to attain basic human needs? And the idea of basically people being lazy and sitting back and saying, I'm going to make mega millions on real estate transactions and banking transactions and everyone else is going to run around burning fuel like crazy to pay for that mortgage because every time a, a price of a mortgage goes up and rent goes up, then you've got to have two incomes to pay for it. So that's two, two jobs as opposed to one or one and a quarter, which is what it was when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. so that's more fuel. Like I remember my parents, it would be a miracle after 10 years if you ever – or 20 years, ever hit 100,000 miles on your car. People do that in, in three years now. Yeah, so yeah. The resources we're consuming just to pay for a fictitious number that we invented is what's doing all this and, and why we're so addicted to Middle Eastern oil and why we have to be there to control the price of oil and to run it as as a whole technology to extract the oil and get it out of there and we've gotten ourselves in this mess i guess a hermetic kind of uh thought process here as above so below um what we're seeing is it being driven by external forces um is it trying to to destroy what 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 the current paradigm is and in an attempt to bring forward a new one is it going to hit us like a ton of bricks what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, on a religious level above, you know, our ideas are still pretty primitive, in my opinion, on when you really look at the cosmos and what actually happens to a civilization when they reach interstellar capabilities. I mean, the Mayan calendar predicts, I mean, um, the highest level of the pyramid says we will reach galactic um, consciousness. And before that, we reached global consciousness, which was the Internet. You know what the what the Hopi prophecy called the the web. You know the spider's web, the World Wide Web, the WWW. Mm -hmm. And we reach this ability now to search information and see what some guy's doing in in Pakistan or India, right from your your desktop computer in the United States. And that's really accelerated consciousness in a certain way. <clears throat> but I'm working on. I've been recently working on for several years now the based on some good breakthroughs in, in um, consciousness and physics faster than light signaling of different star systems and I'm having great success with a technology interface with consciousness that I use to harmonically pulse the all the I calculate all the mathematical harmonic codes of a star system and I started with Pleiades and we did this three years ago <coughs> on my uh, birthday in August 21st, and when I first sent out the the broadcast, I actually sent my wife singing um, the Frank Sinatra song, Fly Me to the Moon. My my wife is a beautiful <laughs> jazz singer. And we thought, okay, nothing's going to happen. I can't, I don't know if this is going to work. Um, but we did it, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I heard a clear, audible, very compassionate male voice say, congratulations, we received your message. Now what do you want to ask us? Now, this isn't a mental dialogue. Like You could go into a trance or a psychic could go in a trance and they can get mental imagery inside of the mind's eye. This is clearly audible, what is known in spirituality as a locution, which is an activation of something in the brain so you actually hear And I just leaped out of bed and went, oh, my God, you know, my wife was, the first one to send an interstellar jazz song through through, <laughs> through the local uh, galaxy. And I was so excited. And the next day I got up and I started asking, you know, rec what I do is I record in Pro Tools with a really good microphone a series of questions addressing the Palladian um, Council. And I then take that file and I, I plug it into a, a player um, and goes into an amplifier into this technology. And the technology involves some living um, biology. And uh, this is an area that's really interesting because a physicist named Fritz Albert Pop, 
from Germany, good physicists, standard physicists, discovered and proved that all living systems are emitting biophotons, you know, which are you know, rays of light that come off of the, everything living. And he proved the huh. origin of those biophotons is DNA. Fascinating. And those biophotons were traveling faster, much, much faster than the speed of light. So if we were going to try to talk to the Pleiades, which are 440 light years away, oh, my God, where, where we, we actually give more money in foreign aid to those countries, and they hate us, and they really hate us. And I don't, I don't think what just happened recently is really the anger is all related to this film. I think the, the Middle Eastern people are, you know, they really don't like the control that we brought with the purchase of all their oil. So with, with yeah. that, you know, why America is keeping UFO, UFO technology, zero-point energy, anti-gravity so secret at that cost blows my mind, utterly blows my mind that we would do that. And, you know, the last thing I'll say on, on this question is that um, one thing the global powers don't realize is the more you oppress people, the more they reproduce, their numbers get staggering. And in, in our country, the oppression seems to have stopped a lot of people from having kids. And therefore, we're pretty weak when it comes to a global scale. We may th have good weapons, but we don't have a very physically large and capable army and Navy and, um, and uh, Air Force. I mean, we may mm -hmm. think we do, but believe me, we, we're not going to compare to China with um, 300 million capable soldiers. So when those, the more we oppress our own people through rent and banking and mortgages, then we're actually stopping us from becoming competitive on that level. So we're in trouble. That's what I see. I, absolutely. Yeah. But let me let me ask you. I mean, because you you delve into so many realms uh, yeah. of exploration of information. Uh, there's a, there's a, we're in a physical world, but uh, we've got Mr. David Sarita on the phone with us. How are you today, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm uh, I'm stoked about the interview today. I've listened to you several times, uh, and and it's my opportunity to throw some questions your way. Yeah. So here we are. We're we're in the grand year of 2012. December 21st is a matter of a, it's days away. It's less than 100 days away. It's literally a few oh, what, two three three months away. What? Are we going to see what is going to happen? The, the world is already starting to. Just in the last week, things have been going nuts. Yeah, I mean, thoughts? my thoughts are that it <coughs> nothing happens on an exact day. Um, although, when you look at planetary alignments and these type of things, um, even there, you know, lines are are very vague. I mean, for example, if you take a ruler and you really see how fictitious and you see certain flaws in, in mathematics when you look at a ruler, a ruler because each line has a certain thickness. Like you could have 10 centimeters or 12 inches, and you look at an inch and you have a half and a quarter and eighth, sixteen. Mm -hmm. And you bro blow that ruler up to the size of a solar system, and each one of those lines is bigger than our sun. So <clears throat> when you say something is supposed to happen on a certain day, you know, you go, well, you know, we're already in the day because it's the year. And look what's happened. I mean, in the Middle East, we've had Gaddafi overthrown, you know, Saddam Hussein, the Mubarak, the leader of Egypt. People are suddenly, you know, epically getting empowered to say, we don't want any more of this abuse. We don't want rulers that oppress us to these extreme levels. And we're, we realize we're powerful. 